And we are in David Lay's textbook. Section 1.1. 1 .1. And we'll start with some preliminary definition. So, I don't know if most students coming into this class have much, uh, much of a concept of what a linear algebra is, but you've certainly heard the word linear before in high school math or whatever when you learn about linear equations. Uh, in high school math, when you learn about linear equations. They're normally presented like that. Maybe you see a general form, linear equations presented like that. Uh, in this class, we're going to take that general form and we're going to generalize it. So, in algebra, you have two variables, x and y. In this class, we're going to have however many variables we have. It might be two. In the real world, you might have 500 variables. But one thing about this Zoom whiteboard, I've never figured out how to erase efficiently. But anyway, a linear equation is an equation of the form a constant times a variable plus another constant times another variable plus another constant times another variable dot 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 however many constants and variables we have equals some number. And I sort of mentioned this earlier, we can have, I guess, two in practice is the minimum, but in application you sometimes have linear equations with enormous numbers of variables. Like Google's sort of search algorithm, at least as Google presents it, has linear equations with billions of variables. So these constants, these Cs, are called the coefficients. So stealing terminology from polynomials. Um, and also these x's, this isn't quite true, but it's close enough to being true. These x's are all serving the same role in a linear equation. And what I mean when I say that, you know, think back to high school math or college algebra or whatever, and you have a linear equation y equals mx plus b. I mean, let me first make the observation that this linear equation is a linear equation as I defined it on the previous frame. We can rewrite it in this form. 
But the X's and the Y's are thought in general to be playing different roles. The X is a an independent variable, the Y is a dependent variable. And we don't really have that in general here. We just have variables. So an equation has solutions. So a solution to a linear equation is a list of values for x1, x2, up to xn that makes the equation true. So, as a quick example, I mean, if we have 2x1 plus 3 x2 minus x3 equals 0, then 0 comma 0 comma 0 is a solution. These are x1, x2, and x3 values that make the equation true. 2 times 0 plus 3 times 0 minus 0 does indeed equal 0. But this, um, this list of numbers that I came up with off the top of my head is not the only solution. 1, 1, five is also a solution. This, these values, x1, x2, x3, make the equation true. Two times one plus three times one minus five does indeed equal zero. Uh, unless you do something intentionally silly, like 0x1 equals 5, I mean, that doesn't have any solution, because 0 times anything is 0, it can't be 5. But unless you do something silly like that, Every linear equation is going to have an infinite number of solutions. And I know I'm sort of getting below the table here. But the solution set. Is this infinite list of solutions? Well, if linear algebra were nothing more than looking at these linear equations, it wouldn't be much of a math class. We could probably say what we wanted to say in this first uh, day, and then take the rest of the semester off. What makes this class um, 
a linear algebra class is that we don't just look at linear equations. We look at systems of linear equations. So this concept might be familiar to you. It often sort of at the very end of an algebra class, maybe um, people just touch on this. But a system of linear equations is a list of linear equations that we're considering together as a single entity. So something like I know I haven't put a definition on the board, but I think maybe this is best presented by an example. Maybe you have that linear equation. And you have a second linear equation. And instead of studying these linear equations separately, you want both of these to um, be satisfied at once. You want to look at both of them at once. Then the notation to say that we want to look at these equations together, that we want to make a system out of them, is to put those large curly brackets to their left, to enclose them with those curly brackets. And what do I mean when I say we want to look at these together? Well, that will be clarified by the next definition. A solution to a system of linear equations is a solution to every equation in the system. So just like linear equations have solutions, systems of linear equations have solutions. So going back to this, um, let's look at two comma zero. And let's put a question mark by it. And let's ask if it's a solution to this system. Well, to be a solution to the system, it has to be a solution to both the equations. So for that first equation, check. We plug two, um, two and zero into that first equation, we get a true statement. But that second equation is not satisfied. Two minus zero is not equal to three. So 
this um, point, this set of values, two comma zero, is not a solution to both the equations in the system. So it's not a solution to the system. Okay, so what is a solution to the system? How do we solve a system of linear equations? That's the question that's going to occupy us probably for this first week, for today and then for Thursday. Maybe before I address that question. I'll ask another question. In fact, I'll ask two more questions. Does every system have at least one solution. That will be question one. And then question two, can a system have more than one solution. Can a system have two solutions or three solutions? Or maybe, I mean, we saw that individual equations have infinitely many solutions. Maybe the system also has infinitely many solutions. I'm going to approach these questions graphically. And to approach these questions graphically, we're going to have to look at the case where we have two equations and two variables, because that's basically the only case we can graph. I mean, we can sort of draw three-dimensional graphs, but not me. I mean, software can do it. I really can't. And then once we get into four dimensions, there is no way. So let's look at a system of equations. And to make this easier on us when we're graphing it, let's use x and y instead of x1 and x2. But let's understand that x and y are just variables here. There's no implication that one of these is dependent and the other is independent, or that they're playing different roles. They're just names we're giving variables. And let's look at x plus y equals 7, or heck, let's, since I asked if this has solutions, let's go ahead, or what the solutions were, let's go ahead and use this. 2x plus 3y equals was four. X minus Y equals three. That's go over here. So we know that each of these equations 
things. I mean, the linear equation in the classical sense that we learned about in algebra back in high school or wherever. So their graphs are straight lines. Let's go to my favorite graphing utility, which is a website, desmos.com. And let's start graphing. And let's look at this first. I uh, have to go back and forth. Let's look at 2x plus 3y equals 4. So a straight line, like I suggested it should be. And at this point, maybe this is so second nature that we don't really think in these terms, but there's a relationship between being a solution and being a point on the graph, right? So two comma zero is a point on the graph, x equals two, y equals or zero is a solution. So every point on this graph is a um, represents a solution to this first equation, and vice versa, every solution is a point on the graph. So to be a solution to the first equation in the system, we have to be a point on this graph. What about, I typo that, if not x minus three, x minus y. What about x minus y equals three? x minus y equals 3. Okay, so again, there's this relationship between the solutions and the points on the graph. I mean, they're basically the same thing saying that the point 3 comma 0 is on the graph is the same as saying that x equals 3, y equals 0 is a solution. So solutions to the second equation are points on this line. Solutions to this first equation are points on this line. Solutions to the system have to be solutions to both these equations, so they have to be on both lines. 2.6 comma negative 0.4. So this system of equations has a solution. And I mean, in reference to the question we were asking, it has exactly one solution. There's only one point where those lines intersect. And if we think in those terms, is it possible to have an equation, a system, two equations and two variables that has exactly two solutions? Can we imagine drawing two straight lines that will intersect each other twice? 
I'm seeing heads shaking no, and that's correct. Um, there are a very limited number of cases that we can be in as far as the number of solutions go. Um, two straight lines can intersect each other once. in which case there will be one solution. Is it possible not to have any solutions? This time I'm seeing nods. Um, it is possible to draw two straight lines that do not intersect. And because a solution has to be on both the lines, if they never intersect, then there aren't any solutions. Going back to Desmos, if we change this system of equations, and now our second equation is 4x plus 6y equals 1. You know, these lines are parallel, they never intersect, so there is no way a point can be on both lines. So there is no point that's a solution to both of these equations. Let me... So, there must be another case, since I left a blank bullet point. Um, what would the other case be? Can anyone say? All solutions. Yeah, all solutions. Or, or the standard way of saying that. would be that there can be infinite solutions. And that's because it's perfectly possible to draw two lines on the Cartesian plane and then find that they're both the same line, that you just drew the same line twice. 4x plus 6y equals 8. So these two equations are a system with infinitely many solutions. And we want to be a little careful with our terminology here. I mean, not every point is a solution. Like 0, 15 isn't. It's not on these lines. But these lines are the same line Every point that's on one of these lines is on the other line, and there are infinitely many points on the line. So there are infinitely many solutions. And a bit of terminology. If there are solutions, at least one, the system is said to be consistent. Now, the, these pictures I drew, I mean, they're in R2, two equations, two variables. But the intuition we get from those pictures applies to any system of linear equations. No matter how many variables there are, no matter how many equations there are. 
a system will always have either one infinite or no solutions. These are the only cases. And I mean, you can sort of, I'm not going, try, going to try to draw pictures, but in a three-dimensional space, if you have three variables, then the solutions to a system are up there in three-dimensional space. And if you have two planes, they can either never intersect or intersect. I must, sorry, I'm thinking about this wrong somehow. Obvious, how, how can a plane intersect each other once? My intuition is off here. I'm not going to try to troubleshoot in front of you all. I'll just reaffirm what I said, that this is true for any combination, no matter how many systems or equations. Um, it might seem intuitively that only one of these cases is actually interesting and that's the one solution case because i mean the infinite solution case seems to happen when you just have the same equation written in multiple ways right i mean 2x plus 3y equals 4, 4x plus 6y equals 8. These are really the same equation. I just multiplied both sides of this first equation by 2 to get the second equation. So it might seem like this only happens if we have kind of redundant information we should get rid of. It might seem very intuitive that, well, if, some, if a problem has no solutions, there is not much point in looking at that problem. In fact, all of these cases have interesting applications that we'll consider. Um, infinite solutions show up um, a lot when you're dealing with proportions, like when you're balancing chemical equations. You know, there are, um, you're looking at numbers of molecules and the equations balancing um, amounts to a system of linear equations, but um, there are an infinite way that a system can balance depending on how many molecules you have. Like, if you, I'm not going to try to give an example because it's been a long time since high school chemistry, but what you really get is um, proportion in this case. Like there are twice as many helium atoms as there are iron atoms or whatever. And then there are an infinite number of ways that that can happen. Talking about no solutions maybe requires a little more background, but I'll just give the the five second or the 10 second version. You're probably all aware of at least the concept of linear regression. The idea that you have a bunch of points and they're kind of in a straight line and you're trying to find what we call the line of best. Well, finding the line that goes through points is um, a linear algebra problem. You solve a system of linear equations. 
to find the line of best fit, you ask, well, what's the line that goes through all of the points? And there aren't any lines that go through all of those points. So you're looking at a system of linear equations with um, no solutions. And then you ask yourself, okay, well, there aren't any solutions. Can we come close to being a solution? And we'll talk about that. Um, it might be the last thing we talk about, but we'll talk about it towards the end of this course. So all three of these cases have applications. Let's start to talk, although we won't finish, about how to solve a system. Um, we're still in section 1.1. Let's sort of try to get the, the idea down, rather than just sort of present this as some magical process that works. Let's try to sort of work through um, why we're looking or doing the things we're doing. Let me first make the remark that we can change a system without changing the solution set. And let me give just the most uninteresting but also quickest example of this. Say we have x1 plus x2 equals 3, x1 minus x2 equals 1. We could take this system and we could say, I want to write these equations in a different order. I want to swap those equations. Well, I've changed the system. At least visually, I've changed the system, but I hope it's clear that I haven't changed the solution set. Um, if, if we're a solution to that first system, we're a solution to that second system. Observation two, some systems are trivially easy to solve. X1 plus zero x two plus zero x three equals four. Zero x one plus x two plus zero x three equals negative one. Zero x one plus zero x two plus x three equals eight. Um, 
Well, that first equation says that x1 is 4. That second equation says that x2 is negative 1. That third equation says that x3 equals 8. So there, we've solved that system of equations. There are systems that are less, less trivial than this, but that we can still solve. But we'll talk about that maybe tomorrow. Um, but for now, let's just put one and two together to get the idea behind this process. We start with a system. So from this first observation, we know there are ways to change the system without changing its solutions. So we're going to change the system without changing its solutions, but even though we're not going to change the solutions, we're going to make the system simpler. Somehow, whatever simpler means, we'll define that more formally. And then we are, uh, we keep making the system simpler until it looks like this. And it's trivial to solve. So that's the process. Um, and obviously there are a lot of questions. Um, what can we do to a system that doesn't change the solutions. I mean, we gave one example back here, but obviously just if, if we could only do this and nothing else, we're not really gonna be able to simplify the system. So what are we allowed to do to the system? What's an algorithm? so that we're not just doing stuff at random. How can we be sure that the stuff we're doing actually makes the system simpler? Those are the questions we'll address at the end of class today and then in class Thursday. Okay, so by the way, I mean, you have all have varying backgrounds. If you're sitting there and thinking that we should be introducing matrices, we're going to in a bit. But before we do that, let's just ask from the system point of view, 
How can we change a system? And there are three things we can do, two of which are simple, one of which requires a little more comment. We are, and I'm going out of order from my notes and from the book because I want to do the simple ones first. We've already seen this uh, as our example. When you have a system of equations, order doesn't matter. You can write the equations in whatever order you want. So if you want to swap around equations and write them in different orders, you can do that. We can multiply an equation by a constant. This is slightly more complicated, but it's really just college or high school algebra. I mean, if you have this system, you know that if you multiply both sides of an equation by a constant, you're a non-zero constant, you're not changing its solutions. So, I mean, if I want to take that first equation, and multiply both sides by two. I mean, putting aside why I do that or whether it's a good idea, I haven't changed the solutions to the first equation by doing it. And I'm leaving the second equation alone, so I'm not changing the solutions to the second equation. So I haven't changed any of the solutions. That system on the left and that system on the right have the same solution set. This is, third is more complicated. So again, think back sort of to college algebra. If we have a simple system and we're messing around with it, what can we do? Well, we can multiply and or divide the same thing for on both sides like we do here, or we could add the same thing to both sides. But addition is trickier here because we need our x's to stay on the left and we need our numbers to stay on the right. So we can't add, we can't subtract three from both sides of the first equation because then we'd have a three over here on the left. What we can do instead is multiply both sides of an equation by a constant and add it to another equation. And in the five minutes we have left, let's give this some thought and make sure we understand what we're doing here. Let's say we have the following system. X plus Y equals 3. 
5x minus y equals 2. And sort of looking back at this example, we say, well, it looks like having a bunch of zeros makes a system simple. So I wonder if there's any way to take this and replace it with a zero. And I mean, what you'd really like to do is just subtract it from both sides. But that's forbidden because now you have your x's on the right instead of the left. Well, we know that x plus y equals 3. And I'll, I'll talk more about the process I'm use, using on Thursday, so don't worry so much about how I know how to do this. Just make sure that all of these steps make sense to you. I can multiply both sides of an equation by a constant, and I still have a true statement. So if it's true that x plus y equals 3, and I multiply both sides of this equation by negative 5. That's still true. Negative 5x minus 5y really does equal 15. Now, I take 5x minus y equals 2. And I'm allowed to add the same thing to both sides of this equation. Well, I know that negative 5x minus 5y is negative 15. So, if I add negative 5x minus 5y to the left, and I add negative 15 to the right, then I'm adding the same thing to both sides of the equation. I'm allowed to do that. And I get negative 6y is negative 13. And then I replace that second equation with this new equation. And I haven't changed the solution set but I have simplified the system of linear equations. In fact, we could solve this, not in a minute, but we could use the second equation to find y. y is 13 over 6, and then we could plug this, that into the first equation and solve the first equation. Uh, the issue with doing this is it, it's quite sloppy, not sloppy, it's quite messy. And like if you have 10 equations and 10 unknowns, and you have x1, x2, x3, x4, up to x10, it, it becomes really cluttered and hard to work with. So uh, Thursday, we're going to introduce a way of storing 
these linear systems called matrices, and then we'll work with matrices instead of the systems themselves. And I will see you Thursday. Fast dismissed. Uh, I hope you all have a, a great semester.